Good morning. Hope everybody is having a great day today. Um, welcome to our webinar, Keep Your Job Site and Workers Safe During COVID-19. Um, we are happy to have you guys here today. Um, hopefully you'll find some, some beneficial things during this unprecedented time. Um, obviously, this is an unprecedented time for the world, but it's also an unprecedented time for our industry. And one of our priorities is to make sure that we can keep our workers safe during this time. Um, so this webinar, hopefully, will give you some tips on that, give you some real world perspective on what's really going on on the job sites and some ideas of how you can make sure your workers are safe. Um, first of all, I want to go ahead and thank our sponsors, um, uh, GTA. Um, we really appreciate you sponsoring this. Um, also, I wanted to let everybody know that um, uh, uh, we will have this on our website afterwards at MarylandBuilders.org if you want to um, check it out later. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, actually one other housekeeping item. We have noticed that we have a lot of non-members on our, our webinars, which is great, and we're really glad that you're using us as a resource. Um, we do encourage you to join. Um, I think that we offer a lot of great resources to um, the industry, um, especially during this time, um, and membership really drives everything that we do. So um, we really appreciate um, any help with membership that, um, that you can offer. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists, um, give them a couple minutes to talk, and then I have some questions I'm going to ask them. And then um, obviously, if you have any questions um, from the audience, please feel free to use the chat function um, to, or the question and answer function um, to ask questions um, throughout and also give some time at the end um, to answer those questions. Um, so we'll go ahead and start. Um, we have we did try to do a little bit of a variety of builders and um, and subcontractors on this on this webinar. Um, so we'll start with Mimi Crest from Sandy Spring Builders. Good morning, Lori. Um, my name is Mimi Brodsky Crest with Sandy Spring Builders. We are a residential home builder uh, based out of Bethesda, Maryland, and we have been building uh, well over thirty years and. Um, mostly infill buildings, so building single homes or large-scale uh, renovations, predominantly lower Montgomery County, upper Northwest DC, also in Northern Virginia. Great. Um, and we also have, um, so Mimi Crest does a lot of um, the smaller projects. Um, I wanted to bring on Tom Baldwin, who has multiple projects going on with Caruso Homes. Tom? Good morning, Lori. How are you? Good, how are you today? Tom Baldwin, I'm the Vice President of Operations for Crusoe Homes. We are a residential home building company based in Crofton, Maryland. Uh, we build, the majority of our operation is in Maryland, but we have an active adult community in Southern Pennsylvania, and we also build in the Raleigh, North Carolina market. Great. Um, and then we have um, Jim Bartley from Bartley Corporation. Good morning, Lori. Thank you for morning. Uh, keeping Maryland safe. Uh, I'm Jim Bartley, uh, Bartley Corporation. We are a concrete foundation contractor um, in Silver Spring, Maryland. We uh, are entering our 50th year this year, and we've got about 160 co-workers, uh, which puts about 130 people in, at, uh, in the field uh, in this time as an essential um, operation. Um, we're usually on 20 to 25 job sites per day, and we have a lot of challenges related to COVID-19. Um, uh, it also brings some opportunities to our company. It has energized our company, and it has really brought us closer together. So we feel a strong sense of responsibility uh, to be extremely vigilant in this time and uh, happy to share. Great. Well, we appreciate all of you being here. Um, we'll go ahead and start um, with the builders. Um, Mimi, can you just give me a little bit of an insight and in kind of what you're doing as a company to ensure that um, the jobs, job sites are safe? Sure. Um, first, I have to commend both uh, Maryland Building Industry Association and National Association of Home Builders who have done a fantastic job keeping their members uh, and others in the building industry informed, up to date. I know I emailed Lori every time an executive order would come out saying, what does this mean? So it's really been helpful that you guys have been guiding us through this. Uh, so we have been taking that information and sharing it with all of our subcontractors, suppliers, um, immediately 
took the posters that you all gave, laminated them, put them on every job site in both English and Spanish, um, made sure that our job superintendents, so we have seven superintendents out in the field, uh, made sure that they understood this and knew how to communicate it to the workers. So we have sanitizing stations where we have like the large hand sanitizer, you know, on a wall on each job site. Um, I just got my second shipment of about 8,000 pairs of gloves. So we've encouraged our subs and everyone to bring their own equipment, but if not, we're providing gloves and we have explained to them that a face mask is not required, but the minute you get out of your vehicle, cover your face with a bandana, with a t-shirt, with anything you have, um, both to protect themselves and others on the job site. And also, so the community members, because we build in neighborhoods, you know, we are building where people are walking their dogs and children are playing uh, daily. And we want them to understand that we make safety a priority during this time, especially. Great. Tom, um, do you have anything that you're doing that's um, to, to communicate this to your workers um, and to the trades? Any kind of changes in your protocol and how you're operating? Well, I mean, previous to early March, there, there wasn't really a, a novel virus protocol that we could just, you know, take off the shelf and say, okay, well, here's the action plan that you follow. So one of the things we've done immediately is our leadership team has been meeting daily just to go over, you know, any, any updates, whether it's from the CDC the governor's office or some of our local municipalities. So it seems like I know from from like say early to mid March, it seems like the updates were coming, you know, almost daily and we were having to react accordingly. So um, we have sent, you know, numerous emails out to our trade base, letting them know some of the adjustments we've made in our protocols. I'd say one of the most beneficial things we've done is we held our first virtual trade partner meeting. Um, mm. And that was held last week. Over 100 trade partners actually attend the, the virtual trade partner meeting. So myself and Mark Somerville, who's our president, hosted that. And the message was, was really provide the certainty to, to our subcontractors and let them know as a builder, you know, what are we doing? And our mission has been very simple from the beginning is we want to provide safe job sites for you know, our employees, our trade partners, uh, and our customers. And, you know, a lot's changed since, you know, late February, early March. And, uh, you know, I can't stress enough, um, you know, over communicating. You know, another resource that we've used, obviously, you know, uh, Mimi mentioned National Association of Home Builders, MBA, which, you know, we have our, we have the signage uh, that was provided all over our job sites. We are also a member of the Builder 20 Club, which is a, uh, a club within the National Association of Home Builders. And uh, we've really relied on this club for a lot of information. And I can tell you the, the builders and the trade partners that are proactively taking these, these, these steps to, to make the adjustments, to provide safe work sites, they're going to be fine. We're going to get through this. Great, Tom. Um, can, um, back to Mimi, real quick. What, what has been the biggest challenge that you would see um, with trying to implement these protocols? For us, um, implementing is not hard for us as a business to put out there. It's getting the actual workers. I think, our, you know, like Jim, you know, if we reach out to Jim and say, hey, this is, this is what we need you to do, you know, as the owner of the company, he may understand it and, and tell his, you know, his team, but it doesn't always trickle down. So it has to be a constant reinforcement as different trades come into the job site. Um, and different trades, some do better than others, but it's also, you know, been a, the neighbors. You know, we really, and I won't, you know, we've had a couple difficult situations where even though we are well far away from their property and whatever, they don't understand why, you know, construction is essential. Um, you know, we've tried to nicely explain that this is what the order says. You know, we are building homes that people need and these workers need to collect their paychecks. You know, we don't need a whole industry added to the unemployment line. Yeah, we're seeing that as well, Mimi, where, um, you know, there are certain members of the public that don't deem construction as essential. And uh, I want to say maybe it was about a week or a week and a half ago where Governor Hogan, um, you know, basically said to the health department, you guys can go up and, and basically shut down these sites that aren't, that aren't in compliance. So one of the things that we've done is since we suspended all of our interior customer service work, we have some capacity on our customer service team. So 
we have two customer service managers in addition to our director of quality assurance. So they're providing daily um, COVID-19 inspections to all of our job sites to make sure that everybody's in compliance with the protocols that, that we've enacted to make sure that everybody's safe. I mean, you know, we want to do our part and if we get shut down, the ripple effect is, is obviously huge. So, you know, for me, it's urging all of our trade partners and, and builder partners to, to make sure that you're following the, the, uh, the mandates because it, it is serious. This is where a, a tremendous amount of responsibility falls on the contractor. You all need to be able to know that you hire somebody that is um, not just giving it lip service, but actually uh, living it, uh, the good habits that will promote health in this environment. And it takes a lot to corral and train and communicate with uh, over 100 people that are going to 20 or 30 sites. And uh, this is a challenge that uh, many of us contract members face. And so what we have to do is over communicate and we have to have protocols. And as you said, Tom, uh, we got to make them up on the fly and we have to, we have to think, act and, and implement and then, and then optimize, rethink and, and, and revise as we go because it's all new. So um, in order to compensate for that, uh, we found strategies um, critical to, to making, making those habits stick in the field. And one of them is before a truck leaves our yard, they get a coaching uh, 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 about five minutes of coaching. And there is a truck line that goes out of our yard and everybody's patient, everybody listens, everybody um, uh, is following, but uh, not just because we say so when it leaves the yard. Then our, our project managers have to go in the field and hold a daily huddle for uh, job safety. Well, one primary job safety now is COVID-19 best practices. And so that has to happen every morning. And then we've got to have eyes on and, and the builders help us with that. But certainly our supervisors are putting eyes on looking for non-compliance. So that's, that's kind of where, where our world is right now. Great. Yeah, I, 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 um, communication seems to definitely be the key here. And um, I know from our, pers our perspective, it's consistently changing. Um, so really trying to keep up with it um, seems to be um, a, a challenge. Um, what other, um, and this can kind of go to anyone, what other resources do you think that you, you need um, to make sure your members or um, your employees are safe? Um, are there things that you're just, you're having trouble getting, you're having trouble finding? Um, what, what other things are just, are, are, are huge, are challenges um, right now that you could use? Uh, I would say, you know, supply chain came up early. Um, I mentioned, you know, our neighbors and Tom has a, a job, jobs in, or a job in Pennsylvania, you know, their factory shut down. A lot of us get our cabinets from Pennsylvania. So that was one of the first things that we felt the effect of, and mm -hmm. just schedules. You know, we, we also, in addition to our trade partners, you know, our clients, you know, we say builder for life, we mean it. Our clients, whether they're current jobs under construction or clients that need, you know, some kind of maintenance that, you know, unless it's an emergency, we've had to communicate to them, we can't do that. Um, it's, it's just, you know, letting them know things are gonna take longer, we're going to be safe on the job site. You know, they pivoting to, they're not having in, in office meetings, leaving things for them to pick up, but the time it's just going to, things are going to take a little longer. Um, and so everybody's had to adjust to that kind of schedule because we don't want, you know, to a rush of people in a house. I mean, Jim's on the, uh, the front end mostly, which is, is great. It's open, but when you're finishing a house and all of a sudden you've got, electricians one in and you know people installing appliances and painters can't have it we just can't do that anymore the reality is subs need to be staggered particularly on the finish end so jobs are going to take longer so how are you managing that process i'm assuming you have somebody kind of in your staff that's kind of managing making sure the subs are staggered more than they normally are is that kind of the process you're using yeah i mean so we have you know our, our senior management people look at the schedules, review them with the guys in the field. And early on, we're looking to, I mean, we just did a delivery yesterday. 
Um, so, you know, we were lucky that things were mostly there. And of course, the critical thing was making sure we got that final inspection. And mm -hmm. I also have to shout out, you know, Lori, you and I were on a call yesterday with one of our Montgomery County Council members. Um, DPS and other agencies really are trying to do the best they can as they figure out how, you know, they're going to work through all of this. Great. Um, so we, we mentioned a couple times about um, construction being an essential service. Um, there are, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, there's um, several other, I think there's about six states um, that it has been listed as a non-essential service at this point. Um, can you guys describe kind of in your own words why you think it is important that we, we maintain um, being essential? It's a lot, there are a lot of construction uh, workers that have an opportunity, as Mimi said, to work outside, which is a less dangerous environment. And um, it brings it brings benefits to um, to the public. Uh, housing is a need. Um, and to halt housing is going to be a disruption in um, the supply and demand uh, required to uh, to handle a growing population. Uh, in general and in this area. Um, and the uh, unemployment roles don't want um, a, this mass of construction workers. So that's another, another um, side benefit to keeping, keeping them working in um, not always an outdoor environment, um, but it, partially an outdoor environment. I think you could operate in a safe manner, and Mimi was saying it earlier as it relates to, you know, staggering trades. Um, so one of the things that we've done is we've instituted a, a 10-3-2 rule. We're, um, we're restricting, obviously, following the governor's order in Maryland to, you know, keep it to groups of less than 10. So we're allowing on the next year of work to have people up to a group of 10, provided they're, you know, following social distancing best practices. And then on the interior of the home, we're only allowing three trade, like three people in the home at any one given time. And then, you know, not allowing any more than two people to sit in a truck at a time. So, you know, it has slowed the process down a little bit as, as far as construction schedules. But, you know, I think that if you alter the way, you know, you, you do, you know, your construction, that you could do it in a safe manner. And I think to Jim's point, you know, there are some economic, you know, factors where if you do shut down construction, there, there's a there's a pretty bad ripple effect with that. But again, I think if you could do it in a safe manner, and I think most builders are making the adjustments where they are creating, you know, safe job sites, then construction should be 100% an essential business. Yeah, and you know, I've been in this business a long time, um, lived, lived, lived and worked and survived through three recessions. Um, and, you know, my dad was in the building business way back. And, you know, they always used to say, you know, as goes housing, so goes the economy. And, you know, this is a huge sector of the economy, residential, commercial, industrial. Um, and just, you know, we say all the time, it's just not us, the builder. It's all the trade partners and suppliers that, you know, service our work and the people that they employ. So, you know, if there's 30 trades in a house, you know, that's, you know, uh, a, a huge amount of people that are providing housing, providing shelter, which is an essential need. Yeah, we, we certainly have, we have a, certainly have a responsibility um, to, to everybody um, in society, absolutely. Um, just if anyone has any questions, and just a reminder, you can use either the chat function or the Q&A. Um, we did get one question so far, um, and it's specifically for Tom. The virtual trade partner meeting um, that you did, was it a presentation to your partners or was it interactive where they could ask questions and provide feedback? How did that work? Can you give us a little bit more information on that? So the first one we did was, was just a presentation. Um, we did allow uh, participants if they wanted to ask questions in chat, but we had muted everyone just because with having 100 people you know, a Zoom call could get kind of cumbersome. So mm -hmm. it was it was really just us relaying information to the trade partners, but we did um, send out a follow-up um, trade partner meeting. We restricted it to only 20 people, so it could be a little bit more informative where we were going to do some training on our um, 
our, uh, we have a software system, which we call our vendor portal, which shares information with our trade. So that's going to be the end of the month. So that'll be more of an interactive um, presentation. Great. Um, yeah, one thing that I, I have had got a lot of questions about, and this is probably more directed towards Jim, is how do you interact with other trades? Because that's, I think that's a challenge, obviously. You, you want to be safe when you're doing your employees, but how are you working with the other trades um, to making sure they're safe and you can kind of interact together um, through this time? It's, it is challenging and it's something we coach on every, every morning in the truck line and we coach on it uh, during the day. Um, if uh, other trade uh, members don't have the same habits that we have, um, we are going to, and we do uh, request that they understand uh, the distancing that we're looking for and, uh, and we try and collaborate outside. So rather than having trailer meetings, job trailer meetings, we, we request that the meetings occur uh, outdoors. And um, if, if it's not a matter of collaborating, if it's a matter of working together, uh, I think that the, the, our customers have been excellent about organizing the schedules to attempt to keep trades um, separated when possible and limited in terms of um, overlap. So it's really working together that has yep. been the and planning, talking about it ahead of time. Great. Um, we have one other question, um, Tom, also. So you mentioned the 1032 rule. Um, I know that I've seen that before. And I know um, it's been it's been shared around um, the industry. Um, and I think there's just um, the, the person asked, um, they all understand the 10 part, which is obviously a government um, a executive order of the 10 people in any place. Um, but where are the three and two coming from? Is this something that you, you kind of came up with? Or is this something that um, other people are doing? Um, that type of thing. Uh, this came from the large uh, building council. So I know a lot of the larger national builders uh, are enacting very similar protocols. And really this is, this all came about with when there was some rumblings where there was a lot of uh, members of the public that are out there or have been out there taking pictures, posting those pictures to social media, sending them to their state and local legislators saying, look, you know, you guys got to do something about this. Construction is, it is not an essential business. They're not practicing social and so really out of, out of an abundance of, of caution, you know, we, we've kind of followed suit with what a lot of the other national builders are doing. You know, as it relates, I mean, I see it on the chat where, you know, a lot of trade partners are carpooling to the job sites, right? We, we can't control that. What they do before they hit our job, we can't control. But what we're trying to avoid is having six guys sitting in their pickup truck eating lunch because that's not safe. So we restrict it to two people. And, and that is that is a little hard to police at times. And, and we got the same information, Lori, through um, NAHB and MBIA about the um, 1032 or even 632, um, mm -hmm. you know. So that, that, that was great information and immediately, you know, easy to implement because you've got a, a, a concrete rule. And, and just like the social distancing, you know when people are too close and you know it, it's you have to police it absolutely so we had one other we had another question um how are you tracking who and how many have access and on are are on your job sites each day do you keep personnel logs for each trade or how are you tracking all of that so for us we we're, we're inspecting our jobs daily so we have uh, daily inspection logs so uh, our customer service team, as well as our director of construction, uh, are going out and monitoring. But as far as keeping a, a trade log with an employee count of how many people are on the site daily, no, we're just making sure that our um, our employees and our trade partners are following our our 1032 rule and uh, practicing the appropriate social distancing. And, and we pretty much follow the same. I mean, our superintendents have daily job logs where they track who's on the job. Um, you know, and also like if there's an inspector coming, inspectors have asked that the house be empty. Um, so it's really same like Tom said, you know, my business partner, Phil, is out, you know, going by the jobs. And actually we see more of a problem with 
crews out on the road, whether it's a road crew, you know, a utility company, they seem to have more people out and about, you know, in, in an area. Um, so. What we have to monitor, uh, as you all monitor who is, how many are on your job sites, is we really have to monitor how many are in vehicles. We, we have to organize our transportation every day to the job sites in terms of who's driving their car, who's going to ride in the vehicle, is it going to be more than one individual, uh, we're aiming for two maximum, and we're hoping uh, in many cases for one in the, in the, in the uh, uh, work vehicle, and then providing masks and making masks at home. We have champions that are bringing masks to us, and it's, uh, it's a logistical challenge that, um, that we feel responsible for. Um, so we're getting quite a few questions, so I'm gonna kind of run through some of these questions. Um, the, uh, another challenge that someone says is the supply chain, which I know um, Mimi had mentioned. Um, the biggest challenge we're experiencing is the supply chain of products needed to remain safe on the sites, and then asking the trades to supply their own goods seems to be a huge obstacle. Um, and then this is asking about if the association has any sources, um, and we are working on, on trying to figure that piece of it out. But I have heard that a lot, getting the hand sanitizers, getting the wash stations, um, I've also heard people stealing things from construction sites and that type of thing. Um, so that's, that's been a challenge. Um, how, how have you guys kind of overcome that? Um, obviously, you know, we're, we are working to try to see if we can um, get some resources. Um, how have you guys dealt with that piece of it? Well, the supply chain in terms of uh, industrial materials is um, it's critical that we have construction activity so those uh, supply chains can remain open. Um, and as far as the uh, hand sanitizer and mask uh, supply chain, um, we actually dispatch people out to um, Costco's and other places in opportune times to gather what they can. And our suppliers, our industrial suppliers, do a good job of scouring the earth and getting us those supplies as well, but they are still difficult to find. Yeah, we, um, like I said, with the masks, of course, we want, you know, medical workers and frontline people to have the N95 unless there's trades that need that type of uh, face protection. Any face protection, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're mainly protecting from you coughing, sneezing, spitting, whatever on another person. So anything covering your face will work. I saw a do-it-yourself that a high school kid did where he took two ends of a sock, cut them off, made an incision. It worked great. Um, so I think the masks people can figure out, you know, gloves. We've had no problem with availability. You just have to keep checking frequently. Did have several sites where the you know, hand sanitizer disappeared out of the toilets, uh, the job johns. So we have now mounted uh, large hand sanitizer stations that you know, someone would have to make a big effort to remove. We keep boxes of extra large gloves there that anyone can take and use. Um, and we've also, um, in mentioning the job toilets, you know, we have used to be they get cleaned out once a week. We are replacing them much more frequently now. We will always have two on site so that every few days, after two or three days, one gets locked up and then the other one is opened up so that uh, keeping them cleaned. And we were, you know, you're able to find large product disinfectant so that when we're at the finish end of the houses, we have, you know, um, got some sprayers in addition to spray bottles so that we can be sanitizing those surfaces frequently. And that, that was another question. How are you handling cleaning and disinfection when work is complete? Um, and how is that being kind of worked into your schedule? That was another question that came up. Does anybody have anything on the work? Once things are done, how you're handling that? And we uh, for us, it's, go ahead, Tom. I was just going to say, you know, you know, obviously with new construction, there, there's a couple of cleans throughout the process, but they're just getting more deeper now. And then just we've upped the disinfecting um, of, of the homes before we turn it over to a homeowner. Uh, and we're trying to really limit the amount of interaction that even the homeowner has with the home until the end. So for us, we've gone virtual for, for everything. We've really restricted the homeowner from even coming out. So 
you know, from virtual sales agreements to virtual pre-construction meetings to, or even doing virtual walkthroughs, which, you know, for the most part have been pretty well received. I think the public, you know, is empathetic to, you know, you know, these, these, these changes because they're necessary. So, you know, it, it's just, it's something that, you know, I, I think we need to part and, um, you know, we want to make sure we're turning over our home that, that's safe for our family. Disinfecting daily is a huge part of our process um, in order to um, be able to, to operate in vehicles and in our office space uh, with a very limited staff and most everybody's remote now from our office space, but uh, we disinfect our offices every day and we disinfect every vehicle and inspect that the driver is doing the disinfecting uh, at the fuel pump every night. So um, that that has been, we think, uh, a key part of keeping our, our workers safe. Great. Um, has anyone, um, like an, another question, has anyone looked into the idea of having employees have their temperatures taken prior to entering the job site? I know we had, um, somebody reach out to us and say they had the service. Um, so I don't, I don't know if anyone's actually looked into that or, or used a service of that with that. No, we haven't. I mean, we, from day one, <laughs> put out and put out often, if you feel sick, if someone on your job site, you know, feels sick, go home. You know, you can't show up on a job site um, and to look for people that are not looking like they're feeling well, but we, we haven't gone to that. A great resource that we received from National Association of Home Builders was um, the COVID-19 response plan. So mm -hmm. we took that and tailored it specific to, to our, you know, to our operation. And, um, you know, using that as a guide, if, you know, if somebody's showing symptoms, what do you do? If somebody's in contact with somebody who has COVID-19, what do you do? So, you know, we rolled that out to all of our trade partners. In addition, we encourage that, that each one of those trade partners has a, a response plan for, you know, if, if it is found that somebody you know has symptoms uh, or has been in contact with somebody or is even diagnosed with COVID-19. Yeah, that, that was another question. How do you manage, um, or hopefully this hasn't happened, anyone uh, manage someone that has tested positive on the job site. We also, um, for people that are watching, do have a couple of samples of the action plan on our website um, that NHB gave. And then we also have a member that, that gave us an example as well. Um, so we do have that as a resource if anyone's looking on that. Um, has any, I'm sure you, none of you have had someone test positive yet, um, I'm assuming. Okay. okay. And how would yeah, you, how would you manage? We have had to self-isolate people because we've been on job sites where a different trade tested positive mm -hmm. and they, uh, out of fear that they will have shared the same uh, portable bathrooms or use the same handrails, uh, and in one case, there was some shared equipment. Um, we, uh, we learned a lot from that process and we did uh, put people home to self-isolate for 14 days as a result. Great. Yeah, so I mean, I, I got a lot of questions about, um, obviously, one of the challenges that we have is there's not a lot of guidance specific to our industry. A lot of the guidance is much more general. Um, so is there any other challenges that you've seen? And I, I get calls from, I don't know, interior designers and, and different people like that trying to say, well, what does this mean for us? Have you, what are your other challenges that you've seen since we don't have specific guidance for our industry? Um, any other challenges that you've seen um, moving forward? Um, you know, people are concerned about the economy um, a, as a whole. So I, I don't, you know, no specific uh, things like that. I don't, I, you know, I, I email you. That's why I've been a member <laughs> of the Building Industry Association forever. Um, you know, and if people have questions about it, I think there are a lot of resources out there that they can turn to. One of the biggest challenges that we face is fear. Um, and uh, so that's why we spend so much time on prevention and good habits is to um, give people, empower, empower people to be able to function in this ongoing environment. And I, we don't know how long it's going to be. So 
uh, we've had challenges with fear causing people to drop onto the unemployment line and put their position on ice um, as a response to that fear. And so our workforce, keeping our workforce um, safe and motivated is a big challenge. Now, we just got another question about that. Um, have you had apprehension of workers returning to work and what measures have you done to ease concern for this? Because it is, there's fear and, um, and I've heard and I've seen you know, social media posts from spouses that don't want their, their employees working or their spouses working um, on job sites. Um, so is there, have, have you guys seen that at all? Obviously you mentioned there, there may be people that just choose not to work and, um, and that type of thing, but have, how have you dealt with that or have you seen that? Early on, um, we had one situation where it was a spouse was concerned and the person made their own decision that they wanted to work. And, you know, when I said frequently to people um, that I run into, you know, one of my superintendents said, until you tell me I can't work and work safely, I'm working. You know, I, I want to work. I need to work. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's going to be unsafe, but you know, that the people in this industry are hardworking people. Mm -hmm. it, it has really uh, brought people together. Uh, people have done amazing things in our company and in our industry to um, rally around this, this risk and this effort and to see the people working together in our company and other companies um, has been uh, inspirational to me. And I think that that has counterbalanced the, the desire to run and not run, but to uh, not participate in um, this essential activity. Um, so I would say that, that the, the good habits, the communication and the coming together has been the counterbalance to the desire to um, separate from, uh, from the workplace. Great. So we're going we're gonna to get ready to wrap up, but I'm going to ask each of you if you have any, um, any tips or um, tools of the trade. I think that um, there's been some great things mentioned um, so far, but I'll give you some kind of party, opportunity to do parting words. Any tips that you have for people to kind of get through this period of time um, as we move forward? Um, Mimi? Uh, first of all, Tom, I love the virtual meeting for the trade partners, so thank you. I'm stealing that. Um, <laughs> And, and Jim, you know, you're right. It has brought people together in a new and different way. And my one word of advice that we use even before this current crisis, but more so now is humor goes a long way. And I'm not talking about the like silly memes or things like that, but like I've been sending out, you know, the good news type stories and the happy feel goods. And then last week for my remote workers, I challenged them to send the best remote work setup, you know, and I awarded a prize um, and they, they enjoy it, you know, so trying to make people feel comfortable, laugh a little because they are scared. We're all somewhat scared. You just, it's a lot of uncertainty. So if you can bring some humor and, and happiness, I think it's a good thing. Um, Tom, any parting words? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're a home builder, uh, trade partner, if you're operating in this environment and you don't have uh, new safety protocols as it relates to COVID-19, uh, I would highly recommend that you sit down with your leadership team and come up with, with some protocols and some standards that will allow you to still operate as a business but keep everyone safe. Uh, the other part, too, is, you know, a lot of people are working remotely. Um, so some of the things that we've done is daily Zoom huddles, which keep the interaction up. We're doing a, uh, a mandatory today at one o'clock. We're saying, look, everybody shut down their email, turn off their phones and take a walk on exercise and take pictures and send it into the office just to, you know, as humans, we need that connection. And uh, it's, it's, it's tough sometimes at home where you take it for granted. You go in the office every day and see the same people for you know, five or 10 years. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're just sitting there in an office at home and all you have is your golden retriever. So um, I'm get some air and uh, utilize the resources uh, on the website MBA and uh, National Association of Home Builders, especially relates to the COVID nineteen response plan. Great, and Jim. 
Well, relationships is the key, and um, and cultivating and 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 sharing is, uh, as Mimi said, with with happiness and uh, humor is the best way to bring normalcy to this situation. But we have a, a challenge, and that is that we have different education levels, different language barriers, and so what we have to do is communicate, communicate, communicate in every way we can, which means um, we have to do it in written email, we have to do it in voice robocalls, we have to do it in person, uh, talking uh, in various points during the day, we have to show people uh, what we mean, and then we have to monitor that they got it. So the, those are the, the best methods that we have for moving forward. Well, thank you guys so much for, for um, participating in this. I think our, our key message here is um, we need to keep our, our workers safe. Um, and um, as we move forward in these very uncertain times, and I think we all need to get a little humor and a, a little bit of different, um, different perspective um, on a daily basis. Um, so thank you very much. Um, we are doing our safety stand down today, so we hope all of our members will participate in that. We have a whole bunch of information on our website, so please check that out. We have pre-recorded safety stand downs in both English and Spanish. Um, we'll also be doing a live I have Facebook um, with our president, Jude Burke, in about five minutes on Facebook Live. Um, so please use our resources, um, reach out if you have questions. Also, if you're doing something fun and creative, we can also put that on social media. So please um, feel free to send that to us as well. Um, so thank you all and um, hope everybody maintains some safety and some humor and, and tries to get through this the best that we can. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Be safe. Yep. You too.